Kavi, thanks so much for doing this. No problem. First of all, uh, how are you doing? You see, how am I supposed to answer that question? It's like one of those questions where if you just say, I'm fine, thank you, it's just like your most generic kind of like lackluster person in the world, right? You know, but it's like, you know, we have to challenge people when they ask those kind of questions, like, how are you? You know, it's like, well, in what mean? Did, you know, did I get the test back? You know, um, you know, um, what do you, how, what is my spontaneous um, outlook on reality, you know, of this like, a whole sequence of catastrophes in the world that just keep happening. How do I feel about all of that? You know, I don't know. I mean, what, in what sense, in like the existential sense of how am, how actually am I? You know, but this 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 mass of like molecules that I move around on a daily basis by the power of my hand, by the power of my mind. You know, you know how I don't know. I don't know. It's it's a very difficult question to answer. You know. And that's like, you know, yeah, because it, it goes back to the actual nature of reality, which is incredibly confusing. So, no, I don't know. It's, it's um, you know, you have to kind of, you have to kind of, uh, <laughs> this is, yeah, I'm going to make this as difficult as possible for you. <laughs> you have to, you have to kind of, no, you have to kind of like qualify the question, you know. Okay, sure. So that, that's, I mean, that's a good place to start. There's lots of different ways of looking at that. How are you, how's your mood? How are you feeling today specifically? Right. Let's try to get specific. Last right. few hours since you woke up, it's how not, are you feeling? Actually, how's, it, how's your mind? It, it shouldn't, it shouldn't really, you know, I mean, those things are important, but it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, you just have to kind of get on with life, you know, regardless, you know, everybody knows what they should be doing, regardless of how they feel about it. You know, you know what the right thing is to do. So it's like how you feel isn't really that important. It'd be, yeah, it'd be good if you could feel good all the time, but it's like a very few people are happy all the time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, still you've got the um, the maxim of, yeah, whatever makes you feel happy, you should do that. You know, but, uh, you know, there's axe murderers out there who are like, you know, in ecstatic bliss, you know, in, in a room full of like entrails, you know, with, you know, arterial spray all over the walls and they're like yeah you know whatever makes you happy you know but no we can't we can't just put things on on basis i'm probably like the interviewer's nightmare because uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah just no, no. yeah yeah go around the go around the houses you know with all the questions you know but um yeah feelings are uh uh, uh, uh uh you know are not are not that secondary secondary you know to 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 duty you know of what, of what what actually makes us tick you know that you know the second birth is when you actually figure out well, what's my role in this world? What's my purpose? You know, so that's that's the that's the important part. But feelings, you know, so that you can get really caught up with that. And people just waste so much time on just like, how am I feeling? And then this gossip. And oh, I felt like this. He said that, and I felt like this. And then she said this, and I felt like that. You know, you know. And people, you know, this whole show's just you know. And people get paid a lot of money to listen to people talk about these things. Mm. Okay. All right. So tell me a little bit more about what you think is, like you say, something slightly more important than how you're in feelings. I think you said service and duty. Oh, yeah, and duty. So yeah, what would what would be the most, what would be a better question maybe than how are you? Know, how are I you? I can't tell you how to interview me. You're the <laughs> dude in charge, you know? Well, in terms of what you think is important, like you said, maybe duty, what do you think could replace how are you potentially uh, as, yeah. a, as, a, as, a, as a maybe a more all right, relevant feelings, question? Your, your feelings are all over the place, right? So it's like, you have to be grounded in something like intelligence should be able to uh, override the mind, you know, and, and the dictates of the mind. Because the mind will throw up all kinds of things. And if people just act on impulse, you know, marriages will fall apart, all those kind of things. Because marriage is like a duty, for example, right? You're married and you're supposed to soldier on with your wife no matter what, you know, to have and hold, you know. Um, the, the vows that you make in, in the church before, you know, the, the priest and the community. And, and that stands for something, you know. But then, you know, Oh, you know, the, oh, the secretary looks nice, you know, and the mind just, you know, takes over and, and you and he doomed, you know, he's ruined, you know. But that's when you just listen to your emotions and your feelings and you're not actually attached to duty itself. Material happiness can be incredibly dangerous. We have to understand that, you know, just whatever makes you happy. It's not it's not about being happy, you know, because being happy is, is a rare thing. And, and who knows why it surfaces, you know, in the most, you know, um, unusual or like... The circumstances that where, where happiness arises can be, could, it can be disconnected from reality. You could win the lottery or something. You could be completely miserable, you know, because all of your friends come around with a handout and so forth, and you're not feeling happy for that. But you could be in the trenches, you know, and you know it could be a war and it could be hellish. But you know, the camaraderie and that life on the edge type thing, you could you could get that epiphany when you like go over the edge, you know, and it could be just 
you know, ecstatic bliss for no reason, you know. Mm. Okay, so it's more about duty and to service to others. Oh, it's more about making others happy than the yeah, self yeah, yeah. happy. Yeah, you I think yeah. that's the that's the most important thing yeah, to pursue. Put, it, it's not. It's one of the most important things. I mean, yeah. you know, to put others first is a start. You know, is a golden rule. You know, I, I I fall back on that when I lose sight of higher things. You know, but you know, to lose, you know, to to put others first, it, it takes you out of the equation and your feelings also, and you think about other people. Maybe other people's feelings, you know, are more important as well, because. You have to follow something, you know. Um, you know, like Bruce Lee said, don't fear the man who knows a thousand kicks, fear the man who knows one well. Mm. You know, so you've got to stick to one particular discipline if you're going to do it, you know. You've got to stick to a school of thought, you know, an ideology, something that you can actually, you know, perfect, you know. Mm. You can't just do like, you know. I mean, you've got people learning martial arts and they learn like 10, 15 different styles or something, and then they just, you know, it's not really going to do. Just stick to one style if you needs be or to I mean I don't know much about that but I'm just giving that as an example it's like you know what what's 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 your belief you know what do you believe your purpose is and it's enlivening if you you know bump into somebody who also has a very strong sense of purpose you know because then you can really kind of like kind of bounce off each other and um, you get in some amazing conversations because they've actually there's some substance there you know it's not like a storm cloud that makes so much noise and, you know, boom and like lightning and ooh. Mm-hmm. You try and grab a storm cloud, there's nothing there, you know. That's just, it's just noise, you know. Yeah. You know, but realized knowledge, realized knowledge is like when you, when you believe something, you know, don't show me philosophy, show me the lifestyle. You know, you should love knowledge so much that you live by its dictates, you know, that somebody actually lives by the, the knowledge that they have learned because it's changed their life, you know, they, they heard something and they live by it. So that kind of knowledge is very powerful, and um, and it takes time to actually get there. So yeah, stick to a certain school of, 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 of and build on that, and build on that, and your character will actually be strengthened and so forth. Mm. Okay, so and so your main uh, the main idea, like set of principles you're following, is obviously the, you're Hare Krishna. Yeah. So you're in the Hare Krishna mo- movement. So um, just before we get into some of the, more of the ideas. Um, that we've just, that we've, I'm glad we've jumped straight into right away. It's been a, a fun start. Um, could you maybe tell, like, anyone who's listening who, who isn't too aware or aware at all about what the Hare Krishna movement is, what it's actually all about? So what does it mean to be a Hare Krishna? Um, you know, um, you know, we just um, find a trance-like state of spiritual perfection, you know, give up all worldly objects, Give all the money to the man at the top, you know. Drink blood, you know. Sleep on the floor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, you know, they've got this kind of like. <laughs> oh, I'm loving this. No, one. no, no. Um, what do we do? Uh, well, maybe, okay. maybe everything you said was right there, apart from the blood. Right, drinking, yeah, hopefully. Do, no, but it's like you know, we kind of get you know the cult status. It's still there, but it's been a long time since the seventies, since the seventies, and it was kind of like lumped in with all the other seventies cults, like the Moonies and the Charles Manson family, and all oh, the Hare Krishnas, and you know, because a lot of kids just renounced, you know, and oh, they were like hippies, you know, they weren't dirty hippies. They were just like the middle class hippies that kind of dropped out and were looking for an alternative, and they found the Hare Krishna movement. And what the Hare Krishna actually taught them was the exact opposite of the seventies counterculture. You know, it was like the counter counterculture of the seventies. You know. Because the counterculture was all about hedonism and, uh, you know, uh, as anything is actually. Hedonism just means merriment, you know. But nothing wrong with merriment. Focus, like, like it's focused more on being happy, which you said earlier is maybe problematic. Because, like you say, it was all about hedonism and, and yeah. uh, psychedelia yeah. and drug taking and, right, and right, trying right. to become blissful and happy. But you're saying yeah. it was a counter to that, actually, Harry Krishna movement. Yeah, counter yeah it, was, it was against um, material happiness, you know, because okay. material happiness is very dangerous. But... Spiritual happiness, that's, that's trying what we, what we promote. We want people to be happy, but without all of the baggage that comes along with it, you know. If you want to become happy in this world, it's like, there's just so much you have to do, you know. I, mean, I suppose family life would provide a, a certain amount of happiness for a lot of people, but it does come with a huge, a huge uh, responsibility. And, and the way that the world's set up as well, um, uh, the, the, the educational system and uh, credit system, workforce, you know, it's just... It, it's so kind of frightening to get into, you know, because you suddenly get in debt and then 
you're having to work, you know, and if you don't work, you might even go to jail, you know, if you, you can't pay your bills, you know, it's like, you know, there's just so many things that can go wrong, and it's just the whole way it's set up, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the family unit, but I think it should be, a, you know, things should, should just get relaxed you know, a lot more, you know, it's just that, you you know, seen it yourself, like you live in the city, right, it's like, everything's just cr cranked up to like 200%, everybody's running around like, you know, look at the travel system we've got underground, you know, it's it's so kind of like, you know, um, amplified, you know, it's scary. Mm. But I suppose what we try and offer as a movement is a, a cultural alternative. Cultural, not cultish, you know. Um, <laughs> Just to make that clear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, where people can kind of, we offer an alternative, you know, which is a lot of people what they look for, you know, an alternative. I mean, some find it in a, I don't know, in, 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 in a, I don't know, so, you know, they, they look for it in, in, in places, you know, where they, you know, don't, you know, where, where they do get like glimpses, you know, people are, have used, um, you know, psychedelics and things like that. And they've had glimpses into something else, something otherworldly, but it doesn't last, you know, and I don't think it's, it's probably just like in a material experience. It's not, I don't think spirituality would be so cheap that it can be found in a, in a capsule. But it does give uh, an, an idea of something beyond, you know. So, um, what what spirituality should be doing is that it should give you an experience that is beyond material imagination. I suppose by definition, if people ask what spirituality is, you can't really explain it, you know. So what the Hare Krishna tries to offer is a, is a place like a temple, like um, a community, and a discipline where people can experience things. Church isn't just about faith, you know. It, I mean you know temples it's not about just a, a congregation that you meet on sundays it's it's a 24-hour program of 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 step-by-step -step process of self-realization where you actually have an experience beyond matter beyond um sensory perception um yeah yeah that that's basically what we try and do you know it's, it's a discipline and people should, by the end of it, they should actually have, um, uh, if not just to just be content, you know, but you know, also be able to progress into higher levels of of understanding what this world is, and what our role to play in it is, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 yeah, yeah, and you can change 100 percent, 200 percent, if you allow it, you know. But it starts with that question, you know, of like why, you know. And then people they they come you know they they come and they inquire and they may go here they may they may go to the church they may go to the mosque you know but they want to find out they want to they want something higher so mm -hmm. spiritual organization it should give you that experience more than anything it, it should provide an experience you know that you should feel something when you go there and it can happen in the at the beginning you go to a Sunday program or you go to the church at Christmas and they're singing hymns you know not like the Rudolph the Red Nose right but like the really like in, in, invoking ones you know like in Latin or something, you know. Mm. Your Dios mundo factus es natura mirante, mundo renovatus a Cristo regnante, gaudete. Gaud. The whole church is shaking, you know, and you're actually involved in some kind of glorification, you know, and you feel it, you know. Because let's, let's say the, the soul is real, you know, the spirit is real. For example, you know, a lot of people, well, I want proof, you have to give me proof. No. Proof to who, you know? You know, what a um, you said a few things about the community and the temple and you know more simple way of living. But what are some other other ideas or practices or, or things that you do as a Harry Christmas movement? I don't know too much about it, but I know that there's um uh, there are kind of commitment I think to vegetarianism and there's yeah. meditation, specifically chanting. Yeah. Um, can you just say a little bit more about what you? You know what what life's like as a Hare Krishna as opposed to not being. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it depends. You know, I'm a monk. You know, so we follow principles. You know, we don't eat meat for first of all, and that's tied in with mercy. You know, because we don't want things to suffer. You say, oh, yeah, well, you eat vegetables though, don't you? Vegetables, they've got life. You know, and it's true. You know, you chop down a tree, you kill the tree. You, you know, that's true. You know, but you want to. Um, 
we want to reduce the suffering, okay? Because we've got to eat something, you know, I don't want to die because I've got this, the human body is a very rare species of life that we've, we believe in reincarnation, so another reason why we don't eat animals, you know, because, you know, you don't know who's in there, you know, or who they've been in the past lives. Anyway, but they deserve the chance to kind of, if an animal finishes its life, then it can reincarnate. If it's a cow especially, it might even get a human rebirth, you know. Cow is a very auspicious animal in India, so they're right at the top of this chain of reincarnation. Because according to, you know, most people waste their human rebirth and they're born back into an animal species again. Because, well, how do you live? Do you live like a human or do you live like an animal? What's your activities? Do you just spend the whole day chasing goals and, you know, looking for food? You know, it's, I mean, but animal eating, sleeping, mating, defending. It's like, is that all we do? Or is it something else, you know? We have to inquire, you know? That's why, just to go to the church, you know, temple, and just contemplate, you know, even just once a week. Great, good for you. Do it. But are we gonna do something? Yeah, yeah, yeah but practice, I mean, why not all day? Why not contemplate all the time? You know, it, it's an important thing. Dedicate your life to this this goal. So yeah, eating eating meat is um, it's basically like if you expect mercy from God, then you should show mercy to animals. As otherwise, it's hypocrisy. God is superior; we are inferior. Animals are inferior; we are superior. So if we are superior to an inferior source, if we show mercy to an inferior source, we can expect mercy from a superior source. You know, it's kind of a, a watertight argument. If you're a theist, you know that was why you should be a vegetarian. But people like the taste, you know, you know. I don't know, the taste of what? Adrenaline, you know, suffering, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's vegetarianism. And we do chanting as well. You know, you see us in the street sometimes. That's a bit more difficult to explain because it's, um, it's to do with sound in its purest sense, you know. Because sound um, operates on many levels and sound can do all kinds of things, you know. Sound way back, it was a, it was a higher science than it is now. I mean, with like you can shatter glass with sound, right? So it's very subtle, but it can affect the material in certain ways, you know. So sound can be um, directed, and in all scripture, you know, first there was the word, and the word was God, and then it developed from there. So sound is like the first thing in creation. So it's a it's a very powerful phenomenon, and there can be material sound, but also spiritual sound as well, hymns and so forth, a lot of songs and singing, the uplifting of uh, 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 sound of of music and so forth, you know. It's a very powerful medium, so it's also an expression as well because it's um, it's relative. So you have many different ways to express yourself through sound according to your mood and so forth. So it's a very useful medium of prayer or a communication, you know. So the mantra, or the mantra is what we chant, the Hare Krishna mantra is a way of communicating with God. And, um, and if you connect with God, then it can become very ecstatic. And you may see us dancing in the streets for seemingly unknown reason, just chanting three words. But the names of God, and um, if the soul does exist, and and you can get a relationship with God, then you know you God, and then bhakti is the relationship. It's a Sanskrit word, you know. It's the connection between you and God, and they say also His name is is non different from Him which is difficult for us to understand because, you know, I say your name, Joe, and it doesn't, you don't manifest immediately, you know. But God would because he's absolute, you know. So the, the mantra is an absolute sound vibration which manifests um, God in our life. And a prayer usually has, you know, you pray for something and then you get what you want, right? And, oh, God, please, you know, send me, you know, I want to get my kids through school and they've got to pass, you know, the driving test or whatever. And then God miraculously makes all of that happen. And oh, thank you, God, you answered my prayer. But the mantra, there's no, it's not like a business. It's not like I do this, you do that, you know, I'll, I'll pray to you. They, what it actually gives you is more prayer. It gives you the ability to, to chant more. Because the, 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 the prayer is the, um, the, the, what, the, the, the benediction you get from praying in that way is the benediction to pray more. Because the prayer itself is the benediction, if that makes sense. So it's just ongoing. It's like a, a serpent following its own tail, and it just—that's how it becomes eternal. That's how you become eternal. You know, that's the—that's the philosophy.
for chanting. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that's probably the thing people most associate with Hare Krishna is people, uh, you guys <laughs> out there on the streets chanting. Banging and, the drum. Uh, yeah. Banging the drum. Jumping yeah. around, yeah. You say there's like a, there's an experience of connecting with God when you're chanting yeah. in like a state. So can you, it may be hard to explain, but well, tell me a bit it's, more it's what beyond, you mean by that. <laughs> by, by nature, it's beyond material imagination. So, you know, I mean, you've, you've probably had experiences, right? That you wouldn't be able to explain to me. But if I... Let's, let's see. Have you ever uh, tried Babadeen? No, I'm not sure what that is exactly. Right, okay. So you wouldn't have, you know... But if I say like salt and vinegar crisps, right? We connect that. Okay, you know exactly what I mean, right? The taste. And it's like ping. Okay, it appears. Okay, so then we connect on that one. Now, if salt and vinegar crisps was a realization of God, then we would also be able to connect on that level. But even more so because it's an absolute experience. So, um, in that way, yes, I would be able to explain, but um, it wouldn't be through words necessarily. It would be more through emotion. You know, because people can feel emotion. You know, they can, you can feel when somebody's angry, even if they might not, even, they might even have the back to you. You're like, you go into the headmaster's office and it's like facing the window. Oh, sit down, boy, you know. And then you just kind of like, you know, <laughs> you can sense, you know. You know he's annoyed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something's going to, even before he says anything, you know something's mm. going to happen, you know. So it's like, you can sense people's emotions. So love of God, you can sense it, you know. Or you can, you know, somebody comes, like an advanced devotee would come into the temple to give a class and it's just like packed, you know, and everybody's like there, just like, like waiting, you know, for the person to speak, you know. You know, and everything that they say is just like, you know, like you're just amazed, you know, you just, wow, it's just like waves, you know. So, yeah, it, it, the, it, it's, um, it's a very impressive phenomenon when people achieve such high levels, you know, of, of, of pure of purity, you know, the purity of, of intent, you know, purity of desire, you know, um, tunnel vision, you know, on, on, on the goal. You know, and, and not only that, but just also being able to... Um, sacrifice so much, sacrifice the whole life, you know, to be able to spread that, you know, furthest to experience as well. You know, you find the, the greatest thing. It's like a woman with a diamond ring, you know, you, you, she goes around, she shows everybody, you know, look what I got, you know, type of thing. So, yeah, you're going to share things, you know. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's another symptom, you know. Somebody's really advanced and they've got, like, pure love of God, then the, the mood is to share it with everybody. You know, I think because there's different types. There's some people that go up into the Himalayas and they just kind of go, mm, they just, and then, and then it's out, they're over. You know, they they get what they want and it's out, you know, they're gone. But there's the others which are more like the preachers, they would spread it, you know, go into the streets and bang the drum. Mm, yep. <laughs> okay, so, how, yeah, how did, how did you become a Hare Krishna? What, can you tell me a bit about your wow. story and journey? Well, I, yeah, man, he's, you know, we're all getting born into this world and we're just totally confused from day one, right? I mean, think about it. You know, you spend nine months in a bag of water upside down, right? And then you just come into this world with like a with like a flood of mush, you know? And uh, what? He held up, they hold you upside down and they smack you on the back and then you start coughing up and then screaming and... You know, and we just accept it. You know, I'm a bipedal sack of water, you know. You know, that's what, no, I believe that's what I am. I truly believe that's what I am. Look, this is who I am, you know. I just accept that, you know. So, well, that's that's how I, you know, how it all starts. And that's, you know, very little I can remember. Nobody really remembers that far back, you know. You know it's good, a good practice to try and trace your first memories. And what I found was with a lot of people, it's through smell. You know, I remember the these candles that my mother lit to help us breathe as children, but they were like eucalyptus or something, you know. But that's that's the first memory that I can think of, that smell of the eucalyptus. So you grow and you start to question, you know, and I hated school. And um, I remember like some of the drawings that I did as a child, and it was basically a man sat on a mountain looking over the city, and then it's like this thought bubble, you know, like the cartoon thought bubble, why, you know, why, you know, why is all of these people running around like ants, you know. What's the what's what's the motive? You know, you know, why should I just get involved in all of this? What's the point? But you know, because society is the way it is, and you just have to kind of toe the line. You know, 
you know, so you go to you go to school up north, and everybody's playing rugby, and you're forced to go on this scrum and get kneed in the face, and you know, taken down in the winter, and people like running into your kidneys, you know, with the shot, and you you know, getting thrown. <laughs> yeah, it's awful, you know. It's like up north, you know. Where was that? Where were you from? Up, up H- Huddersfield. Okay, yeah, Yorkshire, where it's grim. But um, yeah, so you know, you look for alternatives, you know. Luckily, well, or not luckily, I suppose, it was like dance music kicked off in the early 90s, you know, uh, late, late 80s, 90s. And um, and that provided something for the youth, you know. It was, I suppose that's always been there, like repetitive beat, you know, and, and drug abuse, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so that suddenly came and um, I was kind of caught up on that scene for a few years, just um, going out clubs and raves and so forth. And uh thinking that I'd found an alternative, you know, but it doesn't last, self-destructive, you know, you get a glimpse, you know, I, I don't really regret it, you know, but it's like one of those things and it's just everybody's like, oh, best time I ever had, best time I ever had, but not really, because you always repaid for it the next morning, you know, the come downs and, and just the end of the squalor that you end up living in and the, the person that you become, you know, over years of just that kind of lifestyle. So it, it, it does give you like glimpses of some heavenly thing, but it's still dualities because there's always the come down, you know? It's not just like spirituality should be an ever increasing ocean of bliss. It should be always improving on the, what you previously had. But those kind of things are just still dualities. It's like heaven and hell, you know? So, you know, as much as you enjoy, you would suffer an, an, an equal amount. It just, there's no, there's no real payoff, you know? It's just a bit more extreme. So, I knew it wouldn't last, you know. It seemed fun at the first, you know, because you're part of something. But then you realize it's like, you know, nobody really, once the light goes on at four o'clock and it's over, you know, everybody just goes home and nobody really cares anymore. You know, these, oh, yo, we're going to go on holiday. I love everybody. You know, it's, who cares, you know? It's just these sweaty faces and this, you know, people's feet slapping on the floor and, and everybody just looks tired and old and it's just over. All the magic's gone, you know? So, you know, that wasn't really what I was looking for, um, I suppose. At the time, you know, it was like, made sense because I didn't want to just get a nine to five. I just saw good friends just getting jobs and stacking shelves. Nothing wrong with stacking shelves. But if you had so much more to offer the world, you didn't really want to do that. You wanted to do something else. The thing was, it's like, some of them, they didn't want to do that. But I was saying, well, how do you do it? They said, I would just shut off. You know, you get used to it. Somebody working in a barbell factory got the thing put the thing, click, 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 put it over there on a the shelf, did the same thing, click, click, put it on it. And that was what he was doing all day. And, you know, maybe he would do something else and get a break, but so how do you do it? It's like six hours a day, eight hours a day. And so you just shut off. And that's really scared me because it was just, you shut off, it's your life, you know, you, you, you stop, you, your life just stops. So I didn't want to do that. And I was getting really scared and I, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to know if there was more, you know, something hidden, you know, something that nobody would seen or something that we'd missed, you know, because it, it felt like that. And then I started looking into spirituality, you know. I mean, I ended up moving to Egypt when I was about 14 or something. And I was there for about four years. Um, and during that time, I had a lot of Muslim friends. And, you know, I was impressed to some degree. I like I liked the culture, I like the mosque. Was, but again, I was just an idiot child and, you know, we ended up, I had a lot of rich friends and we ended up going out parties and getting drunk and just to say it's just a stupid waste of time you know which I could have, I could have done so much more but anyway you know no regrets move on you know so anyway after that um, I was you know I went back and forth you know I was back back in England when I was like 19 and I did all the club scene and when I was about 23 I ended up you know, 21 actually I was I went to a Buddhist monastery for some time. Mm-hmm. Where was that? So when you came back and said you're 19, where was the... Uh, I was I was 19, I was, when it was about 20 or something. I don't know. Um, I was like, um, it sounds all over the place, but it's, um, it's a very kind of blurred time. I'm trying to get my family to write down a chronological thing to show where we were actually at those years, you know, because it was just... Um, yeah, difficult time. But I know that when I was 21, I left the Buddhist monastery and I went to Thailand and I was there for a while and that went horribly wrong. 
and um, ended up coming back to England and then I just ended up in Amsterdam you know same thing clubs and um, you know more drug abuse and then um, I just ended up on the streets you know for about two weeks you know and I had nothing you know I ended up living with these like um, scousers in these tents in the middle of the park you know and we were shoplifting just to buy you know uh stuff and um and uh yeah and i ended up doing the wrong thing i stole some hot dog i just stole a, a box from a hot dog stand in the middle of damn square and i ran and i got chased by the police and they've arrested me put me in cells and i sobered up you know for some time i was there for two or three days in cells and i got out and um i had nothing you know and that's when i heard it you know it was just like ching ching ching, ching. it was harry krishna's they're doing there they had this huge festival called the, the ratiatra where they put like a they get this cart and they put it in the. They put the forms of God, Jagannath, Subaladev, um, Jag, Jagannath, Subhadra, and Baladev. The forms of like uh, ecstatic forms of God. You know, they, they have these huge eyes and like big smiles, and uh, they're pulling them down the street. You know, it's like this cartoon cart. You know, with big wheels. You know, it's really tall, and it's got a big canopy above it, and the, every, you know, there's hundreds of devotees. They're pulling it with rope down the street. So I just happened upon it. You know. And, uh, and they were giving away free food as well, which is something that I went on to do later. Uh, and I approached them and I said, oh yeah, yeah, it's, you know, I used to be a Buddhist, but I'm on the street at the moment. I, is there anywhere that I can stay? And like, yeah, sure, you can come back to the temple if you want. And, uh, and I went back to the temple and I joined the same day, you know. But that never happens, you know. Like even here in, in Soho, if somebody just came to the temple and said, oh, I'm on the street, can you just let me join immediately today? It wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't, it just, I don't know how I got in, you know, mm. and, and, or how I met them just on that day, because that festival was only once a year, you know, mm. so it's like one of these weird synchronistic kind of events, you know, that suddenly just kind of like turned over and I just was lucky enough to kind of step in and I was just, you know, picked up and carried away, you know, you know, like an alien abduction, you know, so very kind of weird circumstances and uh, I was, yeah, I was lucky, I suppose, I just never looked back. And since that day, that was 1998, I never, I never turned to drugs or never was celibate since then. And just, you know, kind of just kept my eye on the prize, you know. You know, you, you, you know, you have to, you know, you may get knocked back from time to time. You may have moments of doubt and you may lose faith or, or so many things, but you're always able to kind of get it back, you know, because what's the alternative, you know? Mm. Okay, wow, that's very, that was, that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, every, every, every saint has a future. No, every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future, you know? Mm. So, yeah, it's like, nobody's perfect, and, you know, I'm only telling you this because there might be somebody out there who, who's, who's suffering so much that, but it's never, it's never, it's never too late for anybody, really. You know, there's always an opportunity. I joined, you know, and I was, I did nothing. I mean, there was absolutely zero reason why I should get it, you know. Because we believe in karma and so forth, and you think, oh, well, you know, I must have done, you know, to, to be able to get a good, but there's nothing really you can do to get a chance for eternity. There's no material action that you can do to get a chance for a shot at eternity. You know, what, what could you do that's material that would equal the the benefit that you would get on the spiritual platform if 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 eternal life is true there's you'd have to perform an eternal activity to be able to get an eternal result you know but there's nothing that we can do so it comes in a causeless way causeless there's nothing i did that allowed me the opportunity that i got i don't know why it happened you know but it did and i'm happy it did and my only initiative was to to go along with it to accept you know so you say that yeah you um you heard these Harry Christmas so at that on that exact day when you were actually struggling having a difficult time, but uh, but actually you say from like a young age you always felt a little bit different in the sense that you were searching for something more. So maybe it sounds kind of inevitable that you were going to end up in some uh, something like this because from a young age at school you were always questioning and. Thinking it was a bit different. Did you? Yeah. Did you? Did you? 
did you think that would happen or you just it was it was like you said it was a bit all over the shop you didn't really know where it was going in your life like i wanted to be part of something different you know and i'm glad i got the opportunity because my mum was always traveling you know and i was always happy to go with her you know because there was a divorce early on but my mum got wings after that and she took you know me to cairo my two other brothers they didn't want to go they stayed in england they came out eventually but you know i was the first i was overjoyed to go to egypt i wanted to experience something else it's not that I didn't really like Yorkshire, but it's what Yorkshire became, I suppose, once we, once people started. Because, I don't know, we, we moved away from Yorkshire, but there was a lot of kind of like, I was always different, you know, and like, I'd always kind of like end up getting bullied and things like that. I wasn't really too much on the in crowd. And I I just saw injustice, you know, uh, all, all the time, just injustice of like, you know, might is right and things like that. And... I, I I didn't really like I like the world I like being in nature and things like that but I just didn't like people so much or the way that society was set up so I wanted an alternative but I just didn't like some people I didn't like the majority of people but I knew there were good people out there but I just had to find them I even wanted to go to the, some alternative school and my mum was ready to help me out because she was very much into you know alternative li- living in the higher states of consciousness she was a big fan of this movie um, Forbidden Planet which was about the Krells and the power of the Krells, and because they had this power of the mind that could make thoughts reality and things like that. She's very much into higher levels of consciousness. And she wanted to help me, and she was very happy that I actually found this, you know. So, you know. So, it may seem like, you know, I was kind of like on, you know, because it's always like the thing, well, oh, you, you, you know, you were end up a druggie, and then you went to Amsterdam and you joined a cult, you know. You know, because why, and why did the cult get you? Because you're weak, you know, that's why. And they got you, you're weakest, you know, when you... Uh, but it was too much of a weird coincidence for it to be like that for me. You know, I mean, I could see how it would look. And there are people who get done like that. You know, it's like, you know, it's, and it's sad. I came when I didn't really have that much to offer because I was like literally living on the streets. There, was a, there are other people who come and they've got everything to offer. You know, they give up everything. They give up their, you know, Mercedes and their, you know, you know, uh, flat. You know, by the, um, you know, by the river, and you know, th- you know, they give up everything. You know, um, for a higher cause. And that's far more noble. You know, that just the person who comes out of desperation because they're suffering so much they wanted to stop. It's not very noble. But I gave my youth. You know, I was 23 when I joined, so I gave like the last 20, what, 23, 24 years or something. So, you know, that's that's what I gave. I sobered up immediately. I mean, I was. I was good after about two or three months. I'd kind of quit, you know. I mean, I'd quit as soon as I moved into the temple, but to me, to get over the side effects, I actually took a lot longer than that. Because I remember um, getting depression after a couple of years, because it, I don't know, it's strange, you know. A couple that, of years after joining, did you say? That's yeah, when you got depression? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. But anyway, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah, I was kind of I was happy with what I found, and I was um, quite fixed because I liked the devotees and I wanted to be like them ultimately. So that was what kept me going. And um, I, uh, after I moved into the temple, and I just started the food program um, with another debactor, with back to Frank. You know, he was like the, the devotee that would go out every day on a bike, and we'd feed the homeless in Amsterdam. Uh, I would. I didn't even have a bike. I would just run run alongside his bike with a bag of spoons. You know, that was my first service. I just give out spoons to the homeless people, and they would eat. But eventually, I took that service over, and I actually up- upgraded it because I got like a box bike, which is a back feed, so just like this ice cream bike. You know, and we'd load it with dustbins of like you know, it's kitchen. It's like a mixture of rice dal, vegetables, and then another one with sweets, like a it's called halva, which is like it's like a semolina type thing. But, uh, and ginger tea, which is especially good during the winter, because it's very good for um, lungs. You know, a lot of people would die of pulmonary, um, you know, bronchitis or p- pneumonia. They just die from that. You know, so it's just so dangerous in the winter to be on the street, especially in Amsterdam. It'd freeze over. You know, people would sleep, fall asleep in a puddle. They'd wake up stuck to the ground. You know, it was very. It was, that was really severe. You know, that just that whole scene. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm glad I did what I did there. I did about three years doing every day, going out, food for life. 
but I wouldn't go back because it was just so hellish, you know. Because there's nothing you can really do. And you learn that very quickly because nobody listens to you. You go out there with the oh, with good intentions. Yes, spirituality and transcendental knowledge, you know, you should give up the, these, 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 you know, these make-believe worlds that you've created, these cocoons that you have, you know, tied yourself up, you know, after years and years of drug abuse, you know, give up, you know, these, you know, man-made chemicals, you know, and, Listen to me, I shall show you the light and type thing. And it's just, nobody's listening, nobody cares, you know. They don't care. Give them a plate of food, you know. Get on with it, you know. Yeah, what, what is the average kind of public reaction when you go out in the street around here near Oxford Street? You're trying like, to speak the people. The different. The are people different. open and, or is it very nobody difficult? What, what are people like, like when you love them? it. They love it. They love the chanting. Everybody loves the chanting. Yeah. It's because it's, it's so lively and people are, just, people are actually genuinely happy, you know. With the chanting, how would you do it day after day if you're not happy? You know, so the people who go out. I, I know, I, I used to go out a lot more regular, but then I got involved in um, doing media and productions. But anyway, but you know, when I, when we when we go out and chant and dance, it's it's genuine. People is, they love it because there's no intoxication in it. It's just like you're high on something else, you know, and you, you you'll be happy. And people like to be happy and they like to dance, you know. And they'll come over and even if it's ridiculing, like ah, because a lot of people, drunken people, love us, especially you know they'll come ah, I kiss, ah, I kiss, and then little friends will be clapping to get their phones out. It's like ah, you know, and and it's it's a little bit embarrassing, but we see the good in that, you know, because you know, like after many, many, many lifetimes, you know, if if this is real, you know, after many lifetimes, this one person, you know, even if he's in a dr- most drunken stupor, he gets the opportunity to chant, you know, the names of God and to dance on, uh, on, on hopefully a somewhat spiritual, even if, how, never matter how small, but the some kind of spiritual activity. And who are we to be able to say, oh, stand aside, please? They would do happen to be. This is a serious thing. We're actually spiritual practitioners, and we're doing something very serious here. We don't need you coming with all of your drunkenness. But no, it's an opportunity, you know. So you're involved. You involve them, you know. You get you make people feel wanted, you know. You're part of this, you know, as much as we are, you know. It's what the temple should be as well. It's not like our temple, you know. It should be everybody's, you know. And if people feel that when they come to the temple, then you know, good for them, you know. So yeah, people, people, they like it, you know, if, if it's presented properly. We're not always able to do that because we do make mistakes and we do lose our temper or we do, you know, but we know what we should be doing. We know what the actual standard, how to receive a guest, you know, at the temple, you know, how to um, train somebody up if they're interested in joining as a monk, you know, there's a lot of different things. So yeah, we, we should be accommodating people if we if we claim to to have, you know, this this high philosophy, you know, we should be able to implement it in the right way so everybody feels included. So, yeah, yeah, people generally like it, you know. And then there's the others that don't, you know. They come, oh, it's a cult, you know, and I know about you people, you know. And then you go back to something that happened in the 70s, and ah, you see, you know, it's about 50 years ago, you know. But, you know, they just, you know, some people, they just see somebody having a good time and they want to stamp all over it. Because that's sometimes how material happiness works. It's just, it works. My happiness is your suffering. And it's a very horrible type of happiness, you know. But that goes on a lot, especially in relationships, you know. They love to see people kind of, they, they want to see the ant under the, under the magnifying glass. And for them, that's, oh, that's, that's, that's great. That's, that's their kicks, you know. But it's not happiness, you know. Yeah. So mostly, vast majority of people are very positive, happy to see you. Seems to be. I mean, from my own experience here in London, I think if you did it in, say, um, if you did it like some fundamental state, you know, then we we might not be so well received, you know. Um, but yeah, that would be that, that would be rare, you know. But again, it's like um, people are scared of what they don't understand, you know. So, you know, unhappiness, you know. I mean, true happiness, you know, um, and religion itself is a very kind of controversial thing. There's always and there always will be that debate, you know. We didn't go away. 2008, 2009, 2010, 12, there was this surge in atheism with the God delusion and so forth. But that seemed to have died down a bit now. Um, it didn't go away. And that the debate's still going on, you know. You know, I think science kind of does push back and it does remove a lot of falsehood from the world because a lot of people make claims, but... It hasn't got to a point yet where it's actually crossed over and um, and, and, and replaced religion because it can't because it doesn't deal with that. It's philosophy, you know. Philosophy, you should 
love of knowledge, basically, you know, and it should uh, allow people to think about whatever they want, you know, and and wrestle with ideas and not just say, oh, you can't think about this, no, 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 that's wrong, that's wrong, I don't like that. No, but, you know, it has to be explored anyway, just as we, you know, I've read books on evolution and things like that, just have a, a an idea of what it's about, you know, don't agree with it entirely, I believe with maybe 20% of it, but not everything, but there's some very strong ideas in theism. So, yeah, I mean, there was, you know, there's the atheistic community and they would probably disagree with what a lot of what we're doing, call us brainwashed or or whatever. But again, it goes back to why, you know, why would they, why, why did they feel the need to do that, you know? Yeah, when people are resistant or they're, like you said, I think you said a second ago, that people are scared of what they don't know. Mm. And people then sometimes will be even kind of annoyed about Annoyed towards people who have you know, kind of radically different beliefs, or even sometimes slightly different beliefs. Why do you why do you think there's that resistance? Why are some people more open to things, and some people so closed off? And uh, yeah. Well, it's 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 the it's it's the hand, the hand that's closed. You know, that is symbolic of I know, I know, because they think they know. You know, but you don't know. You know I mean, nobody really knows, knows, you know. Some people may know, know, but if, if that's all you've got, it's all you're going to do is just attack, like, all the time, you know, and smash people and, like, I know, you know, but you don't, you know. But the hand's open. Then you can receive, you know. You can actually, people can give you stuff, you know. But the hand has to be open. It means that you actually, you know, uh, it can be bias. You know, we've got a bias, I suppose, with the Hare Krishna, you know, we have a, uh, theology and so forth but it doesn't just mean that you know I know and this is the only way you know we'll, we'll try it's just that I see the world through a certain lens you know but I will see what measures up to what, what I do and I, that, that's how I measure my truth you know I don't think I have to go around and smash people and show them that I have the only way you know many people practice in, in, in wildly different ways you know but I don't think that makes them them wrong I, I don't. I don't think anybody has a monopoly on the supreme. You know, I think anybody can plug in. You know, because there's some people in the hill tribes they would worship the sun because that's all they know. I don't think God would ex, uh, exclude them just because they're not worshiping him, and in, in, because they don't have anything to worship. They're gonna. They have to set up a temple and put the deities there and worship them prescribed and. Do all of the, 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 the no, but they they have a simple faith, you know, and that's the beginning of spiritual life, you know, you know, for 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 anyone, you know. So it's, and if the reincarnation does exist, you've got an unlimited amount of attempts, you know, in many different lives, you know, where faith is cultivated, again and again. So, you know, resistance is is um, it's just temporary, you know. It's only time that will separate you from the truth, you know, and. Once the hook is in the fish, it doesn't matter how much it resists and tries to get away. You know, it's just being reeled in over many lifetimes, you know, until it will ultimately come back, you know. People resist because they have free will. Now, why did God create free will? That's that's a whole other, you know, bag of spanners, right? Um, it's, it's, it's insane, you know, because why didn't he create us perfect without free will, you know? But f to have a relationship with somebody, it means they have to have free will. So if you just, you get, you know, you ever see like, um, what was that movie? Coming to America? Oh, I've actually not seen it. What was it? Yeah. It was a long time ago. It's Eddie Murphy. He goes to like the States to look for a queen, right? Mm. Because he's, he's a, like a tribal queen. It's, it's a tribal king in Africa, right? And he gets suited up with all of this. His father says, hi, I've got a, a lovely bride for you, my son. He know what's going to happen. And he brings into this woman and she says, oh, yes, my lord, I am going to be your bride. I shall serve you. And she's got all of like this, um, like mechanical attitude towards like, you know, relationship. And he says, okay, um, stand on one foot. She like stands on one foot. Okay, bark like a dog. You know, she's like, ow, ow, ow. So I'm not big dog. And it's, ooh, 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 you know, and, and he says, you know, this, I don't want this. You know, it's just, you know. But, okay, so God in the same way, he doesn't just want, like, yes, ma'am. You know, just like, yes, yes, you're all perfect. Holy, holy, aren't thou holy, holy. And there's just angels flying around him, glorifying him all day. No, because you can disagree. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, you said um, another interesting thing you said a minute ago was you, I think you were saying about some of the different kinds of uh, people who've become Hare Krishna. So it's quite diverse. So um, 
there's some you know, very rich people you're saying give away their possessions and yeah yeah so you've seen can you tell me a bit about some of the characters you well seen? well i mean like i said like i joined from the streets and i didn't i didn't have anything i mean a family was middle class there was no reason for me to go that route you know it wasn't my it was my choice rather than necessity so um you know but there are you know i've met people who used to be like special forces you know but they ended up getting involved with the temple working security for festivals and things like that there was um like hippie surfers you know uh, who just you know started going to Hare krishna restaurant and became devotees you know they like the russell brands as well who somehow got involved started going pilgrimage to india uh, the Beatles, um, George Harrison specifically. Um, actually, um, I think Albert Henry Ford. Is it Albert? Yeah, I think it, the grandson of, of Ford. You know the Ford car company. Yeah, sure, Henry Ford. Didn't yeah, know his yeah, grandson. Henry Ford, yeah. But he has a grandson. Mm-hmm. He he joined the the movement, uh, initiated as Ambarish Maharaj. He gave like millions of dollars recently to a project in India where they're building a temple. It's going to be bigger than the Kremlin. You know, it's called the Temple of the Mind, and it has a whole. Vedic planetaria uh, inside that it will actually turn in accordance to the 24-hour clock. It's a, it shows all the positions of the planets, but from the Indian point of view, which is a geocentric model. It's like incredibly advanced, you know, for India, and it's just just going to be mind-bending, you know. Even Prince Charles went there to check out the architecture because he was like really interested in architecture. So yeah, it's really diverse, really diverse, and you know we take. We take like you know uh, anybody. Anybody can join. You know mm. anybody, and it's all all race. Like my um, my guru is African American. You know, which is kind of unusual because you don't usually associate. You could have like black Muslims, and you could have like black Christians. You're like Hallelujah, I know there's a you know that whole thing. You know, and but you don't usually associate black Hindus. You know, you know. But where's the black black Hindu society? But the Hare Krishna. There's a few spiritual masters African. You know, African, even from Africa, the, the they've got like temples I know, in um, in um, in uh, where is uh, yeah, all over, all over, in South Africa, even, you know, and um, North Africa, uh, all over the place. So it's 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 really kind of spread like wildfire because it's um, it does have a lot of answers. You know, and it does appeal to a lot of people, um, and answers a lot of questions, and, and does alleviate suffering, which is what people want. You know, shouldn't be the only reason because it's not just about okay, well, now my pain's gone, I can do what the hell I want. No, it's like your pain's gone now, so you can become a a, a better servant of the truth. You know, you can fix a bit more. You know, and, you know, you don't have to worry too much about the rocky road. You know. You know, practice more. You know, work more on your on your on your character. Work more on helping others, and being being a better person. It's what we're supposed to be doing. You know. So what what is that thing, or maybe those set of things that brings these diverse range of characters towards the Hare Krishna movement? What do you think is the thing that gets people interested in and attracts them? What about a person? Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's just it's a simple concept of unity. That they're all working for the same goal. You know, it's not. You know, and, and, and because if it is true, um, and the soul does exist, it's not you're not the body. You know, you're not diverse. We're all ultimately um, spirits. We're all eternal. We identify with the bodies, but we're not the bodies. The bodies are what divides us in terms of race and rationality. But on the spiritual platform, it's not that we're all the same. It's not that we're all one, which is a common misunderstanding about Hinduism. But is that we have we are one in purpose, you know? Is that the goal of life is to serve the supreme and serve humanity, you know? And that's it's that simple, you know, just like photons, you know, in the light of the sun. Yeah. Okay, so you talked a bit about your your kind of story and past. So, if there is one, could you kind of explain what maybe like a typical day or week is like for you as a monk? Well, yeah, actually. Kind of what Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question because it was just it ties in a lot with the COVID thing that came recently, because 
they realize during those times because the congregation there's no congregation coming to the temple anymore and they, they are what really added to the variety in the temple is the congregation but if you're just monks living in a temple it's the same day every day practically because you know what your service is you know i do different stuff um during lockdown i just had a laptop and i was doing graphics but i was also doing what they call pujari work which is working on the altar and cooking and things like that so you know okay so like alarm goes off at about four o'clock in the morning and you get up and you take shower and you brush teeth and then you you put on the sacred markings of the tea like you see the the clay this is from a holy river in india and you mark your body with uh, 13 different places on Keshavaya, Narayana, Madhavaya, Govindayana, Vishnavaya, Shradayana, Hrithikayana, Padmanabhaya, So you've got all these different markings on the body. And then you wear like the, the, the robes, uh, you get dressed, and then you go down to the temple room, and you sing, you sing prayers to the spiritual master. You know, the same with the drum and so forth. You know, Sam Saradava, Navalida Loka, Chanaya Karunya, Ganaganatvam. You know, the spiritual master is, uh, you know, um, is is come to the samsaric world and it's like a it's like a, 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 a vast storm cloud that's pouring water over the forest fire of material existence and calming humanity. So you know you sing these prayers to the spiritual master, and then there's prayers to the half man half lion incarnation, you know the personified anger, of the Lord, which is fantastic. Um, you know some people it's like wow well, that's really too much, but anyway, um, truth is stranger than fiction, I suppose. Um, and then there's uh, Tulsi prayers, you know, which was, I suppose it involves dancing around a plant. This is getting really unbelievable. I was trying to keep it like normal, but I'm trying to tell you what's going on at the temple. Well, you know, it gives some respect of nature. You know, you worship you worship the plants, you know. If, if kids, I don't know what they get. Because there's demigods behind everything in India. You know, people worship like nature. You know, there's a god of water, there's a god of fire, there's a god of the sun, you know different things you know so we have um yeah we have all kinds of gods behind everything so um but yeah 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 so anyway you know if you worship gods behind nature you get a better understanding of the world you become more of a eco warrior you become a lot more kind of um conscious of the way the world is and the ecosystem so, you know, worshipping a planet is a bad thing. But that's part of the morning program. It's not the only reason. It's a goddess, you know. And then we do the chanting meditation where you sit down and you chant on beads for like, I don't know, like two hours, you know. It's just Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. You fix the mind on one point, the, the sound. Hare Krishna, it's simple as that. You know? So that, that's still in the morning, is it? After yeah. you've done the prayer, then now you're doing the... Right, right. The Japa Mala, the meditation. So that chanting is our core practice. That's where we basically get our bread and butter from spiritually that's the foundation for practically everything throughout the day so it's like if you fix your mind in the morning you can get a lot more done right meditation is good for even material activities you know because if you get control over the mind the mind doesn't control you you know so easy just to space out on like say facebook or something like that and not do what you're actually supposed to be doing but if you get control of your mind you won't do that because you know what your duty is and you won't be swayed by you know, feelings, you know. Oh, well, that would be nice to know. Just bring it back and, and be able to do what you need to do. And that's what the actual med- meditation is. The Hare Krishna mantra just rolls over. So it's like beads, and on each bead you chant one mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. And you just try and focus on every single syllable. And it may seem strange at first, but then it, it works. You know, it works, and you can actually control your own mind instead of your mind controlling you, you know, and making you do all kinds of bizarre stuff, you know. You know, it's like if you go into a supermarket and all you want to buy is toothpaste, but then, you know, as you go through the soup, so much, oh, look, Doritos and like, you know, Draco Noir and uh, magazines and fruit. And it's just been a blood and your basket full or whatever. And then you get to the checkout, pay for everything. And you're on your way home. And then you realize, you know, toothpaste. I didn't forgot to buy the toothpaste, you know, which is the only thing you went in there for in the first place, you know. But you can get so sidetracked in this world. And you can actually become witness to that in those meditative states, you know. Because you just realize how far your mind goes from, from just saying, okay, I'm just going to focus on one thing. And you try it, you know, it, it, just, it doesn't have to be good if it was a mantra, but, you know, just try focusing on one thing, you know, for as long as you can. 
but then it's just something comes in and it's like this autopilot that just suddenly goes whoop and you didn't even realize it happened you know that's a scary thing it's like did you ever um, remember falling asleep the actual moment where you fall asleep you know you don't because it just happens when you're asleep you, you, there's no way of knowing so when you're asleep you're asleep you didn't realize it happened so it's the same thing when the when this other thing takes over your mental um, uh, initiative and, and hijacks it you know and it can be something as simple as because when you purify it when you're actually fixing the mind and focusing it your mind becomes somewhat clear because you're trying to control it and push it towards let's say something spiritual you know and spirituality by nature is, is a, a lighter field you know and and there is so much relief you know because you give up all of all of the anxieties and everything else of the world and you're just focusing on one thing on self-understanding and it can be quite illuminating and lightning but during those times because the brain functions a lot faster in those kind of circumstances a lot of plan making can suddenly manifest you know oh yeah i forgot i've got to go out and get plastic spoons because i've got to do the food program Plastic spoons, what kind of plastic spoons? Oh, remember as a kid, you know, you used to get those cereal boxes, you get a plastic spoon free with the cereal. And what kind of, and when it touches the milk, it turns different colors. Oh yeah, I remember that. What was on the pack? What was on the box? What was on the box? It was a tiger, wasn't it? Oh, I don't like tigers. Oh, was it a bear? Bears are even more scary. I don't like bears. So you went from, you know, transcendental um, enlightenment to I don't like bears, you know. And, 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 and that can happen in like 10 seconds, you know. Because the mind moves really quickly and it just creates these sequences, you know, of like Christmas, rice pudding, Christmas, rice pudding. You know, just like a sequence of like some seemingly related objects until it drags you all the way out into, you know, around the houses into, you know, into the playground and the housing estate or whatever. It's just you miles away from where you started, you know, or where you want it to be. Because the mind has that power of just deluding and dragging you off into, into other places. It's almost like a separate entity. Like having to live with a with an animal, you know, but an animal can be trained, you know. A dog can be trained. A dog can be vicious, and it can be riddled with lice and mange, um, and it can attack you, and it can attack other people. But if you buy a leash, and you control it, and you you stay with it, and you don't give up, and you groom it, and you're nice to it, and you feed it, and you feed it the right things, you know, then it can be understood, and it can be actually a friend, and it can actually have a use then. Instead of just being like, a, you know, so many people suffer from suicide, depression, all of these things come from mental problems, you know. It's a huge problem, but it's just because we don't take care. We have to be able to know, you know, negativity, positive. Remember that story, the, the Apache thing about the two dogs living in somebody's mind? And one dog, the white dog, one dog, black dog, which dog wins, you know? It's whichever one you feed the most. Oh, okay, sure, sure. So what, what are you feeding the dogs? You know, what, are you, what are we actually feeding our mind? Yeah. You know, is it is it twenty four hour daytime television? You know, so that's not really going to have much impact. You know, it's not going to further your life. You know, you know, is it just going to be like you know, I'm the best and everybody else should get squashed down? You know, because that's not going to get you very far either. Sure. Yeah. So we have to be able to know what what is the right food for the mind. You know, feed feed your head. You know, what's what we're going to feed it. You know, is it going to be transcendence? Is it going to be how can I put others first? How can I be? How can I better humanity? What's the Renaissance? You know, how can I uplift? You know, you know, genuinely uplift. You know, you know, what can I do for others to make them genuinely happy? You know, not you know, you make you buy a, uh, an alcoholic a bottle of rum. Yeah, he's happy. Is that real happiness though? No, Cause it's just furthering his misery. You know. Okay, so. Yeah, we're talking about the meditation and how that can change your own mind. How has meditation or any of the other Hare Krishna practices changed how you relate to or feel about other humans and other people? How has that changed since you've since you've been a monk? Well, if you if you benefit from something, then. Um, it's like you got the cure to cancer, you know, we, you, you want to share it with people. So that's kind of how it works, that's how it connects you to other people, is that you you, figure, you found something that worked for you, and it suddenly removed a lot, of, a lot of suffering from your life, and a lot of unnecessary things, and it filled a void, you know. Because let's say you, you have all of those things, though, unnecessary things, you know, 
alcohol, for example. And you think that's a that's a that's a something. Well, you know, some people work all week and then they have that weekend where they go out and get horribly drunk, and it, and it's all geared on the weekend, right? Oh, can't wait for the weekend, you know? Yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get wasted. It's gonna be so much fun, you know. And they get trashed, and you don't remember much, you know. But it was worth it, yeah, yeah. And you reassure yourself, and your friends kind of concrete the fact we had a good time, didn't we? Oh yes, it was a good time. You know, let's do it again next week. Oh yes, it's gonna be great. But you know, why should be? You know, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people, you know, they 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 kind of have this weekend kind of. You know, celebration and it, and 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 that makes it all worthwhile. It's, you know, and they go round and round and round. You know, this this ritual. You know, terrifying kind of ritual. They think, you know, religion is scary. Well, there's rituals everywhere. You know, you think, you know, you know, you know, religion. You know, and you're, you know, pointless religion, pointless rituals. But <laughs> there's rituals everywhere. You know, and that's one of them, which is way more pointless. You know, there's nothing at the end of it. It's just. A tiny bit of happiness, and then a lot of, a lot of self-loathing, you know, a lot of self-disgust, you know, especially when it gets worse and people, you know, end up trashing the families and getting real alcoholism and and ruining the health and the lives of everybody around them. You know, car accidents, all kinds of stuff. You know, it's it's very dangerous. So, but you have that. So. And then you have to stop, you know. And some people go to AA, and AA has huge results, you know. Actually, it's in, in that particular field of rehabilitation, you know, spirituality is kind of that. It's got the crown, you know. Spirituality is the thing, you know, when it comes to rehabilitation. Not science hasn't got. It can't come in. So, oh no, the spirituality is nonsense here. Science, you know, he goes to an AA meeting, like the scientist there explaining that, like his worldview, you know, it's, it's like that's going to change people's hearts, you know. It, it doesn't have any clout in those forums, you know. Spirituality does, yeah, because it actually gives you purpose, you know, and it does change your heart. So yeah, yeah. I mean, we we just strayed from the point of morning program. That was the meditation that we do, the chanting meditation and so forth, it allows us to ultimately understand ourselves, and ultimately. You know, if you do understand yourself, you know what to do in life. You know, you know, your purpose. You know, if you understand. Okay, well, I'm eternal. I'm spirit. I'm identifying with the body, and I have to kind of try and figure out the source of the universe. Connects with the source of the universe. You know, the source of me, which is non-material. Connecting with the source of the universe, which is non-material. Okay, so that's how do I do that? Yoga means to connect. You know, it literally, it means to connect. You know, yoga, so you connect. And then after the chanting, then you have Kirtan, we play the drum, we jump around and sing and dance, you know. Um, it's good, you know, the community that sings and dances, you know, it's, it's very powerful. It's a very good uh, practice, you know. You know, well, even the Salvation Army, they used to sing and dance in the streets, you know, they used to have drums and the Salvation Army band, you know, and, you know, they used to have all kinds of stuff. I don't know what happened to them, you know. But I think they just think, oh, no, people would think we're silly if we go out and sing and dance in the streets. But it, it, the thing about singing and dancing is it's um, a non-mechanistic activity. It's not me- mechanical. It's uh, like art is not mechanical. It's, there's, you know, it's relative, you know, and people, it also, I suppose it requires a lot of trust as well. If you're going to go and sing and dance, you know, bad people laugh, you know, you know, but you, you trust people that they want, you know, in the temple. So it's a very, um, uh, it's a, it's not an easy thing to kind of pin down what music does to people, you know. But it was always recommended, even in um, Republic. Was that Plato? Oh, okay. Um, yes. Yeah. He recommended that kids do gymnastics and music at a very early age. He said music can touch parts of you that nothing else can. So yeah, it's very important. So yeah, we sing and dance, and then after that, we've got a class from seven thirty to eight thirty or nine o'clock on philosophy, you know, the Bhagavatam. So that's how scripture, um, the main scripture is Bhagavad Gita, which is the story of Krishna to Arjuna, which shows about, um, it's a basic ABCs, you know. Arjuna was a warrior on a battlefield, and he was involved in a fratricidal war where he had to fight against his own family. And Krishna was um, his charioteer. But Krishna was basically a, a, the a supreme personality of Godhead. And... Uh, 
but he was playing a role on Earth as Arjuna's cousin, and he had chariot reins, and then he had Arjuna said, "I can't fight. I won't do my duty." But then Krishna has to restore his faith in duty and explain to him transcendence, like you're not the body. You know, what you think you can kill people? It's like, you know, because you have to fight. But Krishna was encouraging him to fight. He wasn't being pacifistic and saying, oh, don't fight. He was saying, do your duty, because if you don't do your duty, who will? They'll take you as an example. You know, we have to do our, you know, like police. You know, you phone the police. Oh, no, let's, there's somebody kicking my door down. Uh, help me, help me. And the police are like, no, no, I'm not going to help you. I'm a pacifist, you know. I think, you know, just maybe speak nice words and offer them some flowers to them or something. It should be nice, you know. No, you want the policeman to come with a club and a truncheon and a, a some, I don't know, whatever, just to stop, you know, stop the violence, you know. It's not that violence is a bad thing. Violence can be very useful in the right circumstances if they're used by the right people. Um, you know, if it wasn't for good people being violent, the world would be a horrible place, you know. So it's necessary in certain circumstances. And, you know, we get a lot of flack for this, but that's the tr- that it, it, it's actually logical. You know, it's, um, oh, no, you, you should be non-violent. It should be, isn't it all like Gandhi and Ahimsa? No, no, it's not. You know, violence is a part of, part of nature. This is not a nice world, you know, first thing, you know. Krishna explains, you know, this, you know, your goal is to get out of this world, not just to stay here life after life. It's a horrible place. There's all these kinds of diseases, you know. Look at this, thousands of terrible diseases, you know, so many ways to destroy the human body through electrocution or burning or drowning or just, and how many ways to enjoy? So few, you know. So, Bhagavad Gita is, is filled with all kinds of things, karma, reincarnation, um, the uh, material energy, how it works, uh, the modes of nature, the passion, the ignorance, goodness, how to recognize them, um, what is spirit, where does it reside, what are the qualifications of the soul, you know, what, what are its qualities, um, how does consciousness work, I mean, it's just on and on and on. And then you've got Stream of Bhagavatam, which is the Gita kind of illustrated with pastimes and stories of the great kings. Um, there's also Krishna's own pastimes in the Tenth Canto, the Personality of Godhead. So there's so many details about who God is and how he acts, you know. Uh, Krishna having pastimes as a cowherd boy um, in sweetness and innocence so that people can actually read about him instead of just being this unknown character on top of a hill somewhere, you know. It's no, but they give him form, they give him face, you know, he plays a flute, you know. You know, it gives a very detailed description about who God actually is. So uh, you get classes every morning on that, and then after that you get the food, you know, breakfast, you know, which is a food which is all offered to the deity, and when you offer something to the deity, it becomes spiritual, and then you eat that food and you also become spiritualized, you know. You become free from sin. Mushanti Tarva Kilbisaya Bujanti Tetvaga Pam 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 Pam. So it's basically like, you know, devotees, that was Sanskrit, that's from the original Gita, you know. The devotee is freed from all different kinds of sin by offering food first in sacrifice. Those who eat for their own sense gratification verily only eat sin. So he's saying that, you know, we should acknowledge, you know, because most people don't acknowledge. They just come into the world and it's, you know, I'm privileged, you know, I, all of this is mine, you know, and I'm entitled to all of this, you know. No, we're not entitled to any of it. It's like we're given all of these things. We're given oxygen to breathe. We're given water to drink. And we should acknowledge, you know, that all of these things have been given, you know. Somehow we're just suddenly taking it for granted. And, and like that, with that mentality, you're exploiting everything, you know. And that's one of the reasons why the world is such a messed up place. Just because people just want to exploit, and take advantage. You know, there is enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. That was something good that Gandhi said, yeah. Mm, okay, nice. And then the rest of your day, so the afternoon or... Even? Well, you know, I would, after breakfast, I would maybe, uh, sometimes I would go to office and I would do production. I would help, um, in, like, different artists. I would They come in um, with the track and uh, we talk about what they want and, and I would make music videos, you know, either film them or do a green screen and then composite, you know, with 3D animation and things like that. Or, you know, devotees, they would go out and sing and dance in the street. Or they would sell books in the street. 
But me and myself, I would do all different stuff. I used to do all of, of that a long time ago, but just recently, like because of lockdown, we weren't allowed to go out for a long time. So I really kind of went down the rabbit hole with 3D production, design and things like that. I haven't been able to break out of that. So, But I need to get out more, you know, because we, you know, if you're in the middle of the city, it's always good to preach. So it's good to go out and sing and dance in the streets, you know, sell books, talk to people on a one-to-one basis. Because you get into these fascinating conversations, because there's so many points of views out there, and it's good, as even as a test of your own, of your own skills, people will challenge you, and they'll make you think twice, and, and your faith will be, you know, your it will become destabilized, and you'll be thinking, oh no, and you have doubts, and then you'll have to reconcile them, and you have to work through it, and you'll come out a lot stronger, you know, with more more information than you went in with, but you have to kind of open yourself up to those experiences and those people and those challenges, you know. And, um, yeah, because it, it will just ultimately, it will give you a, a more complete outlook on the world. But, you know, it's not for everybody. Everybody has a nature. Have you had many moments where you've doubted your involvement? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think I went through a crisis a few a few years ago where I was very kind of disturbed and very... Um, uh, I mean, I didn't want to leave, but it was just like this. Well, I think I compared it to was like if you're on a tightrope between two mountain tops or something. It's going to take you a whole lifetime to walk across, and you get about halfway. It's now like forty six now, so about three or four years ago, it's like you get about halfway, but you make the stupid mistake of looking down and realize how high up you are, you know. And he wobble, you know, and it's like, whoa, and maybe there's a gust of wind or something, and it's scary, you know. And then you look back and you think, do I have time to kind of go back, you know? It's, can I, can I, can I just go back, you know? Or can I go back to normal r- reality, normal society, you know? Get married, get a job, have children, you know? Because that's what everybody else is doing. I'm probably missing out, you know. And it, that was probably like the answer, and I didn't realize it. And then and everybody's really happy except me, and it's like. But then you think back, you know, and there were happier times before. You just, you know, for some reason the, the mind leads you off. Like that autopilot that I was talking about. Sometimes you're shaving with a razor and it's so sharp you cut yourself and you don't even realize. Somebody shows you there's blood on your face. And then you're like, <gasps> you know, you didn't realize it was so sharp. So sharp you didn't even feel it, you know. And, that, and it came in and it just takes over. And then there's doubt, you know. And then you question, you know. So how do you get through it? Were there any set, um, specific things that you that you missed that caused you to doubt what you're doing, or that you even still miss sometimes now that are difficult? What what could be difficult about being a monk? I don't think so. I think it's just the the freedom that you have, you know. On the outside, I mean, as a monk, is you know you follow principles and you you're expected to act in a certain way, and you know there's no I don't know, maybe like the, the, the social aspect of just being able to hang out with friends and do, I suppose, normal stuff. But, you know, I, I, mean, I sometimes visit my family and I bump into a few old friends and things like that. And, you know, it, it's not really, you know, I, I, you go to somebody's house and they, they, they've got an Xbox or something and they're playing video games and it's just, you just sat there. You know, <laughs> yeah, okay, well, all right, how long, you know like three hours later for it's still there wow you know it's it okay well okay you know it's not you know it's you know it may it, you know i'm amazed you know with how far technology comes like over the years because you know i went i was doing all the missionary stuff in trinidad and caracas and then i came back after that and my younger brother had got like this xbox and he had this game and it was like this zombie game and and you were getting chased and it was like very realistic you know and all the, all the, it was like, you know, my first introduction to these next generation games. This was like uh, 2000 and, uh, 2016 or something. And, uh, you know, all of the, it was amazing, absolutely incredible. It was nigh, it was like stop frame animation. It wasn't like actual, like reality. You're like, no, I mean, look at the graphics now and it's like the metaverse and so forth. But that was back then. It's like, you know, five, six years ago. So the graphics were more like just stop for animation, but I was really amazed, you know. But how long? How long am I going to be amazed for? You know, 
10 minutes they're just playing this for hours and hours and hours and hours you know so it, it's going to wear off you know that's the thing it's like there may be some glimpses you know but once you've done spiritual life for so long I mean I had to travel so I was out you know I broke nationalism I broke who I thought I was and I was out in the middle of you know Venezuela for four years just learning another language and you know feeding people and uh, and doing needful things you know having actual impact you know being somewhere where where light was needed you know Um, and uh, that kind of uh, you know in those moments your time is very important so you don't really have time to kind of like fall back on those uh, like luxuries or you're just those like the downtime that people have here it's not all downtime you know you have to work for a living in normal life you know but I mean maybe a profession would have been a good thing to have but I didn't know what I wanted to be anyway so I'm, I'm kind of glad that I became a monk I don't know what I really miss you know about any of that I don't think there's really much I suppose wickedness was probably quite a funny thing the ability to kind of like just be like blatantly horrible to people uh, usually like because the comedy is based on like you know suffering and modes you know like modes of nature uh, like you've got mode of ignorance you know and jokes are usually funniest when they're in that kind of mode you know in goodness you know things aren't really all that funny you know but you have to be in goodness you know to be able to appreciate those kind of jokes I suppose you know yeah it's um, I suppose that's the only thing maybe just the comedy you know because you know like really 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 funny things are usually like other people suffering you know and it's like you may laugh but if you're on a spiritual path you know you shouldn't really be you know I mean if Jesus he said like all all forms of you know, you know, humor is um, mockery. You know, usually insulting somebody or something. You know, so that kind of wickedness, because that was kind of like funny. English always had that really kind of like on point sense of humor. But if you look at it, it was always somebody suffering somewhere, and that's why what made English comedy so good. You know, like Faulty Towers or something. It was always somebody suffering. You know, and I don't know how that how that would be conducive to spiritual life. You know. So everything, everything should be conducive to spiritual life. So you just don't, you're not given a moment to kind of let up. You know, there's not a moment where you kind of, you know. So just the ability to relax, you know, because spiritual life is, it's like if you're not swimming up, it's like swimming upstream. You know, the moment you kind of give up swimming, you're going to get swept away. But in material life, I didn't have any of those worries. You know, it was just like you know, relax, no problem. But there was still anxiety and stress, and of course, it was. You're going to suffer anyway. That's the point. Whether you're going to suffer spirit for something spiritually worthwhile, or you're going to suffer for something materially, what you may say worthwhile. You know, people suffer to maintain a family. I'm not saying that's wrong. You know, you know, but you're going to suffer anyway. So you may as well do it for the right reasons. You know. I don't know. So, yeah. But you know the the thing is that you don't you don't give up anything once you join the temple, per se. You just everything you use in in God's service, you know. So, you know, I think the only the only thing is uh, is, is I'd, I would have more more freedom, you know, um, in terms of uh, I'd have more freedom in terms of um, uh, creativity and things like that. I'd be able to kind of like really express myself instead of being confined, you know, but I don't know if it's actually a confined to be able to express yourself through, um, you know, through the through the movement and the philosophy because you want to project something. If you're going to, if you're going to do, say, like a project or a music video, you want to do something that, that gives people a strong message of, you know, something sane, something that will benefit them instead of just whatever, you know. Yeah, when we met just before we started speaking today, you were saying that you're a little bit unusual in that you're a monk who does all of this digital production yeah. stuff. Just tell me a little bit about this production you do. And um... 
Well, yeah, I started in about 2008. My brother got me a laptop and then, because I'd, we'd always grown up with computers in the house, but when I joined the temple, I just renounced everything and it was many years just renounced, just, you know, reading books and doing the food programs. But then my brother got me a computer and I remember I grew up with like some, you know, the elementary kind of paint programs and simple animation programs and, you know, I used to make cartoons and things like that. But then I got the program and I started uh, doing like video production. I got a little handheld camera and I was, you know, filming and doing my editing and posting stuff. And um, and then I started doing pr big productions in the Trinidad. I actually did a, well, a Ramayan, which is an Indian epic, you know, with Lord Ramachandra, who's a god is the perfect king, and he had his wife kidnapped and he had to cross the ocean and fight with this demon. And they were very good. But I did this whole epic, you know, and it took me two or three months or something, and I. I got about 60 people involved and I set up all these green screens and filmed the whole thing and did all these online tutorials and taught myself these programs and uh, yeah, 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 it was really, I really kind of learned a lot there, it was a lot of fun and uh, and then I went on to do other projects in the future I did a, I went, I went to San Antonio, they knew that I did um, production so we did a we did a zombie movie. It was like a zombie apocalypse movie because all these all these musicians just appeared out of nowhere and they're like, "Yeah, what's up? You know, we want to do like, you know, you know, we want to join the temple." And it was like, "Well, what what are we going to do?" Because they were like musicians and alternatives. So we said, "Well, let's make a zombie movie. You know, they can write the music and they can take part and act in it." So we did this whole zombie movie. And it just went on and on. It was supposed to be like half an hour, but then it ended up like two and a half hours long. You know, <laughs> it's just crazy. You know, because everybody wanted to be involved. You know. So that was a lot of fun. And then after that, I was doing music videos for so a very alternative place. So there, there was a lot of hip hop and, but like Mexicans and uh, music and uh, trip hop and alternative kind of, you know, singers, you know. So that, you know, we did music videos for them and, you know, help people out, you know, just, you know, made them feel, you know, that the temple was a kind of an alternative place as well. And they liked it, they got involved, you know. Um, but I moved on. Um, I ended up in Denver. I think I did a vampire movie there. Uh, it was about uh, a girl that lived in a suitcase, you know. Vampire movie. It was weird, yeah. A girl lived in a suitcase? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she was just pulled She was just pulled everywhere. But the, the opening scenes was this girl, like this goth girl, all in black, is pulling the pulling the little girl in the suitcase. But you don't see the little girl. All you see is the suitcase is like smoke billowing out of it through the zips and everything. Because it's daytime, the little girl's kind of cooking. But it was symbolic of, like, you know, dragging out problems everywhere. And, and the girl in the suitcase always screaming, you know, she's getting cooked alive. Yeah, so I was happy to get that. So overactive imagination, you know. I'm just glad I found the Hare Krishna movement and not some kind of, like, staunch, you know, uh, fundamental orthodox type thing that would be like, no... This is not of God, and you can't do this, and you can't do well. You know, it depends. It depends on the fruit. You know, you know, any tree is good. You know, you know, but what are the, what's the fruit of that tree? You know, what what? How does it affect people? You know, so if you if you're able to produce something and and speed things up, you know, and and boost like you know um, people's confidence uh, and attract people to. Uh, 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 a, a lifestyle that's conducive, you know, and productive, then it's great. But yeah, you don't have to, you know, creativity is a huge part of the human, human psyche, you know, so it has to have outlets somewhere, you know. So yeah, yeah, it, um, uh, you know, it's a sickness, you know, and a, and a strength, you know, imagination, because it can really, you know, if you don't get the answers you want, if you don't get the inspiration, it can be really, it can really suffer. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to maybe wrap this up in a second. I just wanted to ask you one more thing. Did you want to say anything uh, about the temple that you're based at, which is in Soho? Well, there's a lot of initiatives. We've got, like, a lot of programs where people can plug in. Um, there's a lot of youth programs that, you know, run by some of the monks who are, I suppose, not really monks anymore. They did a few years in the temple, but, you know, they want to, they find that it's somewhat limiting, so they want to kind of, you know, you know, get out more into the, into, you know, regular society to be able to spread the word. So they've kind of got their programs together. And they're doing very well. You know, they bring a big crowd, and it's it's so, it's very informal. Like whereas the temple would be quite 
formal. It's still a great place to go, it's for, especially for festivals. We've got these outreach programs, which are for young people and, you know, and anybody who's kind of inquisitive or anybody who's kind of like, you know, unsure or they, they're not happy with the material life or they, they think they've been cheated somehow, they want something more, then yeah, great place. You can, you know, just tune in, you know, and uh, it might be something for you. And if not, then, you you know, nothing lost, you know, it's just another another slice of reality, you know, you could always, um, you know, you know, the thing is, is you have to find something that works for you. And this might be it, but it might not, you know, but, you know, just keep, you know, keep the hand open. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. And I appreciate you sharing all of your personal story as well. And, uh, you know, letting me know about the Hare Krishna movement and uh, maybe good to speak again at one point. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, Joe. So